Welcome, this is Power Talk and we have with us Kunal Bahal of Snapdeal and we are here to have breakfast. It's wonderful having you with us. And we're going to get you to talk both about Snapdeal, about the startup ecosystem, about the future of the country and about food if you like because you are after all a self-confessed foodie. So what's that Kunal that you're having for breakfast? Oh, I'm just having moosli. But thank you for having me here. It's, um, I'm looking forward to having a healthy breakfast today. Muesli? Are you sure? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I did a workout this morning, so... So muesli is a thing to go? Yes. Kunal, so it's great, great to, uh, having you talking to us. So, so much excitement over the entire startup world, and you've been one of the icons, you know, Snapdeal and the growth of Snapdeal and all of that. But all these things obviously go through cycles. So there was a period where a year and year and a half ago, everyone was saying this is the greatest thing ever, startups. And now just a few people are saying, oh, well, you know, it's all starting to wobble a bit. Is it? I think everything um, goes through cycles, as you rightly mentioned. 2014, 2015 was a big uh, fundraising party yeah. and uh, fund spending party at the same time. I'm not, sh I'm not uh, with people who say people that, that only money was wasted. Um, I think a lot of the money was built uh, was spent to build the right capabilities mm. by companies also. But I think this phase of more rational spending and rational building is also a good one because it's making companies to take a step back and say, where is all the wastage that's crept into our uh, businesses? Let's cut those wastage um, and then build again from here. I think that's a, that's a good thing because going on the trajectory we were going on as an industry was not, a, not the healthiest one. I think you make a very interesting point, and I, it's one of the things I wanted to talk to you about. So the model that many of you, that Snapdeal or Flipkart or all of you were in a sense going, very heavy discounting, a lot of focus on GMV, but not necessarily on the margins or on profits. And that's sometimes when you start saying, is there a bubble happening? And maybe you guys had the funds to be able to sustain it, but every two weeks you had a new startup coming in and saying, oh, I'm going to offer 90% discounts. And then I'm going to lose a lot of money. And then doesn't matter, my GMB is growing, so my valuation is growing. And that smells of bubble. I think in the early days of any industry, uh, let's take telecom as an analogy. The metric that was used was share of subscribers. And I would an the analogy of GMB is to those share of subscribers because that's the only metric in the early days that you can hang your hat on and, and show as a sign of progress. But as industries progress and mature, and ours is maturing very fast, it's very important to revisit what is now the right metric to track progress in this industry. And metrics of the past become merely vanity metrics um, today. So in our view, you know, as I, I agree with you, I think GMV is really a metric of the past. It was a proxy of progress in the past, uh, but going forward, what is most important is, are you growing your net revenue, right? What you make as a marketplace, not yeah. your top line, because that shows the quality of your top line. Because theoretically, you could have very high GMV and no revenue yeah. of your own. Then why you're just running a not-for-profit, right? Yeah. Uh, that's not what we are in this for. Also, not just a not-for-profit, a, a run for losses. And the bigger your losses, the better it is because your GMV is going up. So like in the dot-com bust of 2000, uh, after that, the concept of saying, oh, well, you know, I have so many page views and that determines my valuation, yeah. that went away and never came back. So are you saying that the era of the GMV, of what my gross merchandise value is, that is gone now and not likely to come back? I think it's already gone. Um, uh, there is a lag effect of... I'm getting uh, uh, media persons talk to me a lot more about it now than they did six months ago. We started talking about the fact that the industry has to move beyond GMV to more um, rational metrics and metrics that are truly indicative of the quality of the business around net revenue, margin, customer experience, seller experience, etc. And I think in general, the narrative of our industry has moved in that direction, which is very positive. If I could ask you one of the major questions that many people are asking right now, and pardon me for being blunt, is that people start to worry in a situation like this that now the whole world is open for competition. All the big global players are coming in. You, for example, are up against one of the biggest monoliths you know, that the world has seen or known, which is Amazon. 
if it is about delivering the right customer experience or being able to compete in that, how do you take on the big global giants? I think it's a good question to ask and it's a question that is on everyone's minds uh, nowadays because something has changed over the last couple of years where as the internet space is exploding in India, it's drawing interest from the biggest multinational companies out there from the US, from China, from Europe and elsewhere. The thing that Indian companies can do is retain their deep entrepreneurial spirit because that is something that in our kind of businesses play a very, very big role, being able to attract the best most entrepreneurial team that can go fight and win the market. And how do you win is by doing as much localization as you can. Long term is there an issue that you feel if, for example, the Indian digital space is dominated by American companies, or for that matter, and this is something else that people uh, may be thinking about, what if they end up getting dominated by Chinese companies and Chinese companies come in and buy out a number of them, you know, then what happens? Is, it a, is there a strategic problem with that, you think, in the long term? Look, the, what the Indian government has to think through is that um, the Chinese digital ecosystem, internet ecosystem, has a market cap of, which is converging to almost $2 trillion, which is almost equal to India's entire GDP. And most of that market cap is uh, controlled by Chinese companies, Chinese entrepreneurs. Um, that may be one end of the spectrum, though. I don't know if that's the right end of the spectrum to be at because it's important for us to invite global innovation into India at the same time. It'll help to raise the bar of Indian companies also as the entry of all these companies has done for our business and others. But uh, I think it's something that the government should definitely spend some time thinking about that do they want to promote local entrepreneurship and not making sure that they're not, not, in, not having regressive policies a policies that uh, turn back the dial of time, but at least having policies that encourage local entrepreneurship and being very cerebral and thoughtful about what needs to be done to do that. Right. If I could just you know, sort of come back to uh, the origin, let's just go back a little bit in history, you know, when you were starting this up. And it's, you, you've had to pivot a couple of times, and I'm wondering whether you're going to be pivoting again at some point in the future. Uh, take us through that journey. Apparently, you, would, you were starting with something completely different. It was a discount coupon business. Uh, that's where the name comes from, Snap Deal, if you think about it. And then suddenly, apparently, you made a trip to China and it all changed. Yeah, I think um, our journey, more than most journeys I've heard of uh, in India or elsewhere, have, um, has incurred a lot of twists and turns. It's been obviously very uh, tough, but also very character building and very rewarding at the same time. We started as a physical coupon book business, went to discount cards, then went to mobile coupons, then went to online coupons, then started a marketplace. And that, that was catalyzed by a trip I made to China with my partner Rohit in end of 2011. And what we saw there absolutely stunned us. The scale of e-commerce where companies were shipping millions of packages a day already in 2012 when companies in India were probably shipping five or 10,000 packets, we realized the, the size and scale that Indian e-commerce will also achieve because structurally, India is not very dissimilar from China, where there's a long tail of supply of small businesses and a very long tail of consumers with very different tastes. And we also realized that the winning business model in India will be a marketplace, which we pioneered because most e-commerce companies then and now were largely focused on buying and reselling products, almost like online retailers, mm -hmm. but which is different from being a marketplace where you offer an, a level playing field to millions of sellers, right? Alibaba has 10 million sellers and millions of products to consumers. Just, just to look at your, you know, your, the, the future path ahead there in that, um, obviously, the question of funding is going to keep on coming up. Are you going to keep on having to raise funds to go on competing? Uh, and you do have a war chest right now. Is that sufficient for you? I think um, right now we are, we are doing just fine. Um, it's a, also a function of what are some of the other strategic areas you're looking at. So, yeah. for instance, payments is a big one for us. And uh, uh, we, we acquired this company, Free Charge, which is doing yeah. extremely well. It's growing you know, 300% year on year. Thank you. Um, if we want to get into any other area, let's say content for instance, right? That will obviously require additional investments. But today we are very focused on three key areas. Commerce, which is Snap2U, payments, which is free charge, and logistics, 
because logistics is the underlying foundations that helps our commerce business grow. If these are the areas we are strategically focused on, then we are sufficiently capitalized for a while. You mentioned content. Is that something you're seriously thinking of? You know, I've given it some thought. Um, you know, I feel that with this huge explosion that's happening in 4G, and we are seeing early signs of that in our business already, where the, the shift to 4G is happening a lot faster than a shift uh, from, 3, uh, from 2G to 3G happen. Right? Every month we are seeing a change. And if that keeps going on, then it's clear that content businesses will become viable businesses in themselves. Yeah. And I feel the future of commerce is not everyone just having the same catalog and consumers just searching and buying. I think the future of commerce will be an intermingling of content and commerce. Let me just come back again uh, to some of the personal moments that you may have encountered at that. What was the point when you personally said, I mean, not when you were going and raising, it was a, a Microsoft employee, I think, who gave you your first angel mm -hmm. investment. Yeah. I, I describe those moments to us. And what point did you realize, oh, I think this is going to be bigger than, than I was expecting? <laughs> you know, I think that um, uh, you're, in this, you're on this constant treadmill. I don't think even, I've been doing this for nine years now, right? Even in the last nine years, not a moment has come where we felt that we've made it. I think we are more paranoid today than we've ever been before. And I think that'll be a perpetual cycle for us. Perpetually, we'll be more paranoid than we've been in the past. And I think that's a good thing. Um, so the success or whatever people may say uh, success you've seen, you don't, um, uh, you, do, you don't uh, necessarily uh, let it get to your head. Yeah. Um, also, our industry is extremely dynamic. Right? The, the mortality of technology businesses, often people would say, is, uh, is only a matter of when, not if. Yeah. And if you're not paranoid, then chances are someone will come and hit you pretty hard. No, but the big question that I would have for you then is that what are you thinking of doing now? I mean, like, I'm sure there's a temptation to say, all right, look, why don't I just sell it off to somebody for X billions of dollars and, you know, go off to, I don't know, Maldives or the Philippines and spend some time on the beach or come back and do something else in my life. What point do you think uh, that's a trigger to press? I think, um, I feel we all have one life to live, right? And we, and it's very important for you us. To get bored bumming around on a beach somewhere. <laughs> yeah, no, I, we, we, it's rare to get the opportunity to create the impact that you really want to create and, uh, and touch lives of millions of people. We at a very young age, relatively speaking, speaking, have gotten that opportunity. I just don't know if, even if you gave me $5 billion, whether I can, I have a framework to recreate what we've created even till now. And hence, this, in my view, this is the best way to spend our life, uh, at least for now. Building the value, and you've all started doing some philanthropy, right? I believe there's a village called Snapdeal Vihar or something. Snapdeal Nagar. <laughs> Snapdeal Nagar, yes. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, when you're given an opportunity to do right uh, to, to some people, and it's not going to burn a hole in your pocket, and it doesn't cost anything material, and it's only a question of intent to do that, then why shouldn't you?